Welcome back, and as promised, I have got Peter Mondavi of Charles Krug Winery joining me in the studio, and I feel hugely privileged about this. <laughs> Pete, thank you so much for joining me. Right, Tom, thank you for the invitation. It's, it is literally a total joy. And so, it's when I was putting together my invites, who I wanted to come and join this, you know, I, I didn't know you were in town, and it was the luckiest thing, thing ever. Yeah, you, it's worked it, out great. It's grand. And so, you being in town, I suppose probably is, is indicative of what the story is we're about to tell, which is the Charles Grew Wines, for the first time ever, as an exclusive, have arrived on our shores. They're, they're here, and, and, and that's never been, never been the case. No, we've always been 100% domestic in the United States, and the shipment arrived in July, and out here for perfect timing for the holidays. And you're working with the Top Selection, who are an incredible bunch, so I think fantastic. And the work is... You know, it's, it's such an exciting stage for you here because, you know, the work is really just beginning in terms of you're able to reach out and meet the right people. And, and you know, I think, you know, I can see from some of the notes I've had is, is you know, there's a spread of quite exciting restaurants and bars and, you know, wine shops that are going to be looking after them. And I think there's nothing more relevant to the six, seven pound male audience than, than your wines. Yeah. And so I'm hugely privileged to have this as a scoop. Thank and you. so I'm um, feeling pretty good. How... Tell me a little bit, perhaps to set the scene, and I'm going to pour some wine okay. while we do it. <coughs> but for the audience, Charles Crew Winery, what's what's the history? Because there's quite a lot of history. Yeah, there's there's yeah, extensive history both on the Charles Krug side and my family side. But I'll try to abbreviate it because <laughs> we can go on all leisure. afternoon on at this. At your leisure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, start with my grandparents, yeah. Cesare and Rosamond Davi, uh, born in Italy. They were a very modest means. Uh, their parents were sharecroppers, uh, minimal education, third grade education, nothing to do with the wine business other than enjoying wine, as I think most Italians of course, do. Absolutely. Um, it's completely part of the But culture. they got married in, in uh, 1908 and sailed across the, the pond and ended up in Ellis Island, as all the immigrants did. Um, and, but immediately made their way up to northern Minnesota, just below the Canadian border, because there was family and friends there. He got engaged in you know, toiling away in the iron mines, didn't like that. Started a, a saloon enough, yeah. uh, with a partner. Man after mine heart. This went is went this okay is until Prohibition <laughs> came in in 1919 in, in that part of the country. Uh, and then um, started a grocery store business and because he was dealing in fresh fruits, produce, vegetables. The community, the Italian community, rallied around him and said, go to California, get us some wine grapes so we can make homemade wine. Zinfandel was the primary varietal. Absolutely. Uh, took the train to California, uh, negotiated some deals, shipped them back, sold them out uh, there for homemade wine, which was legal to, for a household yeah, to within make a four barrels. Exactly. Uh, exactly. As long as you didn't sell it, consumed it at home. Absolutely. <clears throat> he got into that for a couple of vintages and said, this is the business to be in. Moved to California, 1922. The whole family, and um, children by this point had arrived. What's that? The kids had arrived by this point. Yes, so, dad, yeah. I mean, Dad was yeah. the youngest, and he he moved out uh, obviously with the family, uh, and it's um, he focused all his efforts on shipping fresh wine grapes, mainly the the eastern coast, northeastern coast okay. of the United States. Very successful. Allow and also introduced my family to winemaking. So if it hadn't been for prohibition. We probably wouldn't be here talking about wine. Absolutely. Yeah, this who is knows it. what we'd be in? But that entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, he was, he was an entrepreneur, uh, but got introduced to winemaking through the home winemakers he was shipping to. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, then, arrives and meets the Charles Crow Winery, which is already in existence. Yes, in, in existence uh, since 1861. Charles Krug of Prussian came over in the 1850s. Through marriage, received a dowry of about uh, 600, well, 250 hectares of land in Napa Valley. He did okay out of it. He did that okay. Right. He did that very, was, yeah, very well. Didn't do too bad. Uh, so my grandparents bought it with their success from grape shipping business Love in 1943. And then my dad, Peter Mandavi, my uncle Robert Mandavi, ran it together, mm -hmm. built it up. Absolutely, famously. And yeah. so, and this is probably an important part. What we're talking about here is is for you know the first family of wine in Napa that you know the the hugely famous name that, that Mondavi is the Charles Krug winery is is the foundation and the base for that yes yes and then of course in the 60s Robert goes and does other bits heads yep, off that yep. way your father remains within Charles, Charles Krug, Krug. Mm -hmm. and so we've got two distinct strands of this famous family and your strand that you still you know run today and helm and head up 
which I believe the fourth generation is still the huge. Yeah, involved fourth generation it. is very involved. Has been at Charles Screw Winery from that point onwards. So there's yeah. quite a legacy here, and there's 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 a kind of there's a total focus, if you like, is the way I'm seeing this. You know, in creating the wines from the estate, is that yeah. fair to say? Is that oh, it, yeah. it absolutely is. I mean, you know, <clears throat> we've had opportunities to go elsewhere, do other yeah. things, but no, the family always ends up in the wine business. Continues. We've been in it since 1943, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least with Charles Krug, remaining 100% family owned. The fourth generation is active. There's one member of the fifth generation, about nine months old, so not quite active Congratulations. yet. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but no, so five generations in California is, is incredible. Yeah. Here in Europe, not so much, but in California, it's exactly it's, it's within incredible. the space. This is this is it. And so there's this brilliant legacy in this history. And it's only now, it's, it, the really exciting bit to me is that, you know, these, these wines have been wildly, successfully, hugely, brilliantly available across the States. And so, you know, you can, you work with brilliant restaurants and you, you, you are obviously, you know, a hugely well-revered and considered name. To get them in the UK now is, that's a huge change. That's a massive oh, yeah, sort of, yes. you know, diversification, I suppose, is, it, yeah. Um, why? What's what's what, why now? What's the what's the? Well, I think you really hit on it with diversification. What we want to do is, you know, we were focused in, in the United States very successfully mm -hmm. in the United States, but with this, uh, you know, global economy, um, <clears throat> and all kinds of challenges happening, mm -hmm. either you know, nationally or internationally, I think it's appropriate to have some diversification uh, in different markets. So That's we're opening up uh, the the UK market. We're opening up the Canadian market uh, as well so as, as we UK speak, and yeah. but, but it starts here. Not to mention our daughter lives here uh, in the UK, so <laughs> good reason to get out here. And she's an ambassador for us uh, yeah. in the that, UK market. That makes me beyond happy because I, I my feeling having, having chatted with you a little off camera as well is this: this isn't a commercially driven thing. Obviously, there's the you know commerce makes up a big part yeah. of it, but it is. First and foremost, it's a family business. Yeah. And the fact that your daughter is in town and, and actually, right, so therefore we're going there, let's do that. You know, what a, what a lovely natural, you know, thing to go and follow. And that, that's pretty special. Now, before we venture a little more into that, I'm just tasting through these. Tell me, tell us a little bit about the house style. I know lots of six, seven pound mile members and other viewers of this probably are going to be thinking, right, what sets Charles Krug wines apart? If I'm going to go and venture into these exciting new wines in the market, what are they, you know, what am I looking for? What is it? First of all, I think <clears throat> our wine style is um, kind of embedded in our origins in Italy. Wine and food are inseparable. Uh, we want to produce a wine style, and, and really Dad focused all his winemaking life on this, which yeah. spanned many, many decades. But a wine that's, that's balanced, a wine that reflects the varietal that we're talking about. Wine that reflects the terroir, where it's grown. We have um, uh, all of our own estate vineyards throughout Napa Valley. And bright acidity, modest amounts of oak, you know, good balance between the, the fruit, the, the tannin from, from the, uh, the fruit, uh, and the tannin from the oaks, and aromatics from the oaks. So we have oak in these, but it's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah overwhelming oak it's not. and, and, and not again they complement food very very well they are they're quite european in their style for one yeah, of a yeah, huge yeah. they, they are there is delicious bright lovely opulent napa fruit you know that, that yeah. that's that's there across the chardonnay so we're, we're tasting the 2019 chardonnay we're also tasting the 2018 merlot both of which are beautiful tasting absolutely fantastically and and the synergy across both of those is this delicious, bright, lovely, juicy fruit. Gentle use of oak, you know, there is, yes. uh, and, and, and quite classic oak. There isn't the huge kind of popcorn and caramel necessarily that, that, that you, you know, would associate with some producers. I think there is, there is an elegance to these. There's a kind of classicism to them. I really, I really quite well, enjoy thank it. Thank you, yes, that's, what we, that's what we strive for. And, and we use only brightness. French oak. Uh, across the entire board. So yes, no, nothing, I mean, American oak, nothing wrong with American oak, it's a different style. It's a little more forward, mm -hmm. a little more abrupt. So we're looking more at that finesse with the, the French oak brings. Okay. I think, I think that's a brilliant standpoint. And again, as a, as a piece to separate yourselves from, from other producers and for, for members and viewers to go, okay, that's what I'm looking for. The French oak piece is important. There's a legacy to that, of course, in that 
the, your know, family was the first to start using French oak. Well, in, in Napa, Napa Valley, yeah, my dad uh, brought it in in the um, in the sixties. Uh, he had taken a a trip to France. Uh, Boy, about a three-week trip with uh, Andre Chelyshev, who was a very famous wine consultant um, in that era in California, and Dad got introduced to French oak, of course. Then couldn't afford it to bring it in, yep. so it took a, you know, a couple <laughs> years later. We brought brought some in, and we've been using it uh, ever know. since. I uh, love then. the. I love the. It's it's easy to meet the winery at this point and and look at the great success and and, and the you know the sort of the scale it's on I suppose but the to to hear about it and and its growth and the, and the points at which you know mm -hmm. we couldn't quite make it to French oak at this point but we we staggered our way there you know it's, yeah. it's brilliant it's this great thing there's actually I've got this brilliant family tree which is absolutely ace and and gives us a really nice lay of the land of the family mm -hmm. as you as you quite rightly said prior to us jumping on the camera was. You know, it's beginning to get complex. It which is, is, <laughs> which is fantastic, <laughs> and I'm quite looking forward to meeting the subsequent generations as well as they're in the UK. They've got to keep in touch because I um, absolutely we I will. would love it. And I think all of this is culminating probably to us to begin talking about the vintage selection wine, which which yeah. I wanted to spend a little bit more time on. And um, this really is the, the flagship. This is the, is the top of it the tree. Is. And celebrating its 75th anniversary. Is that Actually, right? a little is more that? than that wow. now. But well, actually, maybe the seventy, the sixteen would be forty-four was our first yeah, yeah, yeah. vintage. There you so, go. So Do yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so seventy-fifth anniversary. We nice. in fact a couple of years ago when we celebrated that, uh, we did a little tour in the United States. Yeah. Three different major cities uh, had uh, about a dozen Psalms wine press people did a vertical tasting from sixty-four to couldn't go back to forty-four. Yep. But <laughs> sixty-four to current. And and the one that was the favorite at all three locations, yes. different different entirely different set of people. Yeah. Yes, it was the '66, as a demonstration of the ageability. Hundred percent. But but there no, is the tension here. There's beautiful silky, distinct tannin. Um, there is lovely oak. There is a wonderful, really great line of acidity that runs through what is what is again a classic, bold, bright, but nicely balanced cabernet. And so ageability, I don't deny it, I, I, I don't doubt yeah, it at beautiful all, age is the potential for ageability. I think you get a lovely line of that delicious French oak. The selection of vineyards in this, is that, that's principally quite an important thing. It's yeah. all estate grown. Yeah. It's, it's all estate grown, all of our own vineyards. But we there's have two distinct Yeah, two areas. distinct areas. One is the Onfill area, yeah. and we're on the, which is, Napa Valley is more or less a vertical uh, valley, north-south. 25 miles or so, very narrow, mile to three miles. So we're kind of in the center in Yontville, yep. on the western side at the base of the Mayacamas Hills. And those are the warmer, richer wines, if you like, that go into Yeah, the and marine-based uh, soil structures uh, in there, as opposed to the other side, which is volcanic, and I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But we have two vineyards there, side by side, Slinson and Volts. And beautiful Cabernet property, especially yeah. up in the benchlands, rockier, well-drained. Uh, so Slinson has been the dominant source of, of our vintage select Cabernet in, in, the, in, the, in the past. And so we're now incorporating Slinson, Volts, and a newer vineyard purchased in okay. uh, 2020, actually as yes. a forest. Okay. And we were able to carve out a small portion in vineyard. For vineyard. Yeah, and that's in the mountains. I was gonna say, and this is that mountain fruit, higher yes. elevation. Yes. And that brings more freshness and I suppose you know, not intentionally at the time, but but but, but freshness brings some tannins, colours, the, the mountain fruit up there, that's all volcanic yes. of origin up there. About right. five, six hundred meters okay. versus a hundred meter elevation for the valley. Uh, and so that combination is what's giving it that tension balance. Yeah. I love it. Peter I'm sorry to have to wrap. I love it. It's, it is. <laughs> Thank I, you. I could talk about these for days, and I think we've got so far to go into that. But it's been a joy having you. 